Hey, that last video that we did regarding the aluminium panel beating, it's gone down rather well. One subscriber dropped a comment saying that it was my best video ever. Fancy that. So uh, I've decided to do a video on a little bit of rust repair so that you can see just what goes into it and how to make a decent job of it. First of all, why do cars rust? And where do cars rust? Cars rust in places where moisture builds up and can't drain away. That's why you'll normally find rust in the bottom of doors along the sills below the doors and in lower parts of the chassis and around the bottom corners of windscreens. That's because water has got in there and can't get out. In the factory they design ways for water to come out but people during the course of a car's life often don't ensure that these water drain holes are kept free. You'll find them in the bottom of the sills, you'll find them in the bottom of the doors. There should be a wee channel that guides water out of the bottom of the windscreen to stop it sitting in those corners because um, the only protection that steel has got is a, a very thin coating of paint so it's imperative that that paint sticks well and that it's a good quality paint that's not going to degrade over time but I'm digressing drain holes water can get into the top of this pillar and so it needs to be able to get out at the bottom. In the factory a drain gap was engineered in just here but over the years that's plugged up and it's become inoperative so water has built up in the bottom and it's rusting from the inside out. Why the inside? Because there's no paint in there. These things look lovely on the outside, but quite often up inside the complex parts, nobody's painted up inside there, so there's zero protection. One of the things that we can do is to apply a tarry or waxy or oily type finish to protect the inside of these. That can be put on with a brush, it can be sprayed in there, the parts can even be immersed in there. Uh, but there's numerous ways of protecting the inside. You do that after you finish doing the repairs because if you go and spray these compounds and potions and lotions in there now it's going to smoke and burn and fizz and pop and crackle when you start welding so um, that's the the last thing that we do even after painting that's when we do the rust preventatives another facet of um, rust repair is buying rust repair components on vehicles that are very common and they're known for rusting in particular parts there are companies out there that produce parts like this these ones are from Britpart in England they came with a Land Rover that I purchased earlier and I've had them lying around for some time now the tools of the trade for rust repair are many and varied but um, the biggest things that I use is a, a smallish angle grinder with a very fine cutting wheel and I never run it without the guard on or, and without wearing gloves, glasses and earmuffs. Preferably even full face protection. These things are very, very dangerous. They don't stop to say, look out. They will just kick back and hit you in the face. It's as dangerous as a chainsaw. Another favourite tool is the air hacksaw. The air hacksaw reciprocates at a very high speed. It's perfect for getting into tight places and cutting out pieces that you can't get access to using this. Another tool that gets a huge workout is the splitting chisel and hammer. Often with a rotary tool you can't get right into a corner so you might have to break away the last little piece and you can do that with a very fine chisel. Great for splitting spot welds. Now also for splitting spot welds, how I do that, I don't have one here to show you, but I get a drill the same diameter as the spot welds, that's usually about uh, four and a half mil, three sixteenths of an inch, and I grind it to less of an angle. 
it's flat. It doesn't cut particularly well, but I only want it to go through the first layer of sheet steel. When it hits the second one, you always feel it and the spot weld breaks and you can then gently split away the two parts using one of these. And the great thing about having drilled a hole in there to remove the spot weld is that when you clamp it back together, you can weld through that hole doing a little puddle of MIG weld and that makes it look a lot like a genuine spot weld. Just as I suspected, a big poultice of dried mud. And of course, each time it rains, that mud turns wet and stays wet for a long time, and that just adds to the rust at the bottom. So we're going to dig all this out, give it a big clean up inside, apply some anti rust killer, and once it's all reassembled, I'll be filling the inside of this pillar up with a rust preventative. Right, I'm just going to show you the footwell real quick. This one's had an aluminium footwell fitted in, which means it couldn't be welded. It's had to be, well, it should have been riveted in, but the dude who did it didn't have rivets, and it's been put in using gutter bolts. So it's functional, but it's ugly. So I'm going to pull it all out. You'll notice how easily I chopping the, I'm um, chiseling these bolts off. That's because I've cut them in a very specific way. I'll show you that in a moment. It's just a matter of uh, getting the cutting disc on them in a 45 degree angle and slicing half through the nut, half through the bolt. And then the cutting chisel, or the splitting chisel, makes a very simple job of um, just taking out the remnants. So that's all the bolts out. Now I've um, removed the actual panel itself and this is what I'm left with. Just the steel parts. I've cut out a large chunk of rusty steel across the bottom which I'll replace completely. The pillar's all nice and clean. The footwell's um, ready for a bit of a clean up. I'm going to weld a piece down the side because one of the flanges was not worth saving. I've cut it out completely. I'll fold up a piece of 90 degree sheet metal and weld that in. This is a rusty hole that started out just as a, f a piece of paint flaked off where a screw passed through and it's gradually grown and got worse and worse and worse and I've been left with a large hole that I've got to fill in. So the dash pads have to come out, remove all of the hardware from around it, 
Yay, I'm doing a little dance around my pile of goodies that have just arrived from the city on a courier. With this lockdown, I haven't been able to get any of the things that I normally need from my usual suppliers. So I've had to do a little bit of detective work to find out who's still open and who's shipping. So one of the things that I've uh, got in this package is paint stripper and I'm going to completely strip the paint off all of the detailed parts, the parts where paint's likely to flake if it hasn't been rubbed down properly by the people who've painted it in the past. You've got to remember we've got layer upon layer of paint and if somebody's been a bit shonky and they haven't done good prep there's a good chance that in these corners, in these fine detailed areas, the paint's not going to stick. And sure as hell, one day I'm going to be washing this thing with a high pressure hose and blow off a big flake of paint if I don't have it absolutely perfect in its prep. So I'm going the extra mile and stripping it right back to bare metal in the places that most people wouldn't bother with. When you've been using a chemical paint stripper it's imperative that you get rid of all the residues so I've water blasted it twice and you can see how I've removed the build-up of paint from around those rivet heads and behind these tie down points it's all ready now for me to feather back with some rough sandpaper and then I'll follow up with some finer sandpaper to blend in the, these areas so that when I apply the primer it comes out as one nice even coat with none of those awful flaking subterraneous paint relics. In the passenger's footwell there's a lot of double skinning and you can see here where I've had to remove a piece and replace it with fresh steel. It's actually two pieces attached together because the original one suffered quite badly from what they call heavage. You can see on these edges where I've bashed the rust out. Rust gets in between the two pieces of plate and bulges and bulges and builds and builds until it heaves the plates apart. Hence the name heavage. So that's got to go. It's an instant safety check fail. It's one of the things that the inspectors love to pick on in chassis. So whenever you've got two parts of a chassis uh, welded or bolted together, if they start to bulge because of rust, it's something you must attend to. So. I've pulled out the dash pads and I'm about to start on this little gem here. Won't be too hard. I've got these square holes where the plastic screw uh, mounts go into. I'm going to have to replicate those. But the first thing to do is cut out the offending part. Then of course we've got to transfer the thing to the bench and make up the new part. Just a little scrap of steel will do the job. And because the cutting disc that I used is one millimetre thick, 
I'm going to add one millimeter to each edge that I've cut so that I get a nice fitting patch. <coughs> I'm going to scratch the outline of those square holes. And now I can cut the thing out. one millimetre outside the lines Now I'm going to put the fold in. Mark exactly where the fold needs to go. You mark the fold in the middle. I know it sounds very pedantic, but um, as a piece of metal goes around a curve, it uses a little bit of metal to do it. So you have to add maybe one millimeter to the length so that it comes out exactly right. And then we'll put that into the folders. Well, when I say folders, I mean put it into the piece of angle iron that I'm y using as a folder. And then just tippy tap it over with a rubber mallet. Using the other one as an example, so I get the fold right. Yep, just a touch more. I'll do that in the voice. Now I'm going to get a center punch and just lightly, lightly mark in the center of where I'm going to put those square holes and then take the punch away, have a look to make sure it is in the center and then give it a decent hefty whack. If it's not in the center you can quite often just chase it around and get it exactly where you need it so that when the second whack goes in, it gives you a good square centre hole. So I'm now going to put a pilot drill through the middle, and I'll file these out square later when I've actually got it welded into the vehicle. Here we go. I'll go and knock the burrs off that. Then we can whip outside and get the thing lined up into its hole. Now, have you ever seen such a gorgeous welding trolley? Do you recognise what it is? It's Sadie the Cleaning Lady's cleaning cart, which normally has um, brooms and mops and buckets and all sorts of things. Repurposed, like most of the things I use. 
Now that piece of aluminium that I just picked up, I'm going to use it as a heat sink. When you're welding a small piece of metal, it heats up quite fast and you can burn away the edges. So what I do is I clamp a piece of heavyish aluminium behind it and that acts as a heat sink, pulls the heat away from it so I get a nice weld without burning the edges. And it, what it, another thing that it does is it stops too much penetration going through the back and gives me far less to clean up on the other side of the weld. Okay, so now a quick clean up with the flap disc on the other grinding wheel, just to remove any paint and get rid of any shoulders and dingleberries around the area. And I can carry on with a few other jobs that need to be done before we get it ready for the paint. Look at that, by the time that's painted, you won't even know it's been played with. Thank you for watching folks, in the next video we're going to be doing some panel prep and getting ready for the primer and deciding what colour this thing's going to be painted.